Hey guys, welcome back to a new video and today I have the honor to have here Michael Sugar, producer of many incredible feature films and TV show. And today we're going to have a conversation, we're going to talk about spec ads because it's something that, you know, I'm a big fan and a big uh, supporter. We're just going to jump now into the video. Enjoy guys. First of all, for my subscriber, if you want to do a little intro on yourself, who you are, what you worked on it, or what you're actually working on it, and then we can jump to the X4Y probably. Terrific. Well. My name is Michael Sugar. I am the CEO and founder of Sugar 23. Uh, we are based in Los Angeles and New York and Washington, D.C. Um, we are a multimedia business uh, focusing entirely on how to bring creators' dreams to life across multimedia platforms. So uh, we make films and television. We make uh, podcasts. We manage filmmakers and writers and actors and uh, authors we publish books and uh, we incubate uh, companies on behalf of our clients and ourselves. And so we're doing a bunch of things. Um, and most recently we've launched x4y.com and really excited about what that's opening up for creators and for, for uh, opportunities um, in film and television as well. Talking about uh, x4y, which is a, it's basically a platform, you know, that put in touch, connect, creator, and potential clients. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Johnny about this package thing. How did you get the idea? For many years, I was managing partner at Anonymous Content, which is uh, has been for many years and still is one of the most premier production companies for commercials in the world. And uh, some of the, the best filmmakers on the planet are uh, aligned with anonymous content. And I was very proud of the work that that group did, but I saw a couple of things happen. One thing I saw was that the barrier to entry was substantial. Unless a filmmaker was a filmmaker or a television director of great notoriety, the only way to become a director of commercials was to make a fake commercial. And, uh, and so we would see all these incredible commercials. And if they were really good, the better they were, the more likely it was that we would throw those commercials out, sign them up to anonymous content or any of the other, uh, you know, premium commercial companies. And then they'd go become real commercial directors. And this fake work, this spec work would go into the trash. And I thought that was incredibly wasteful because in many cases, the creative, which was designed outside of a creative agency, was better or certainly as good as anything that was coming from the, the global creative agencies. And I thought, what a waste. Also, I see hundreds of thousands of short films are submitted to film festivals every year. Uh, those are usually longer than 30 seconds. They are usually expensive and they are almost never recouped. Uh, because there are very few ways for filmmakers to monetize short film. And it occurred to me that those creators are also quite brilliant. Your creators, your subscribers are brilliant. Many of them, I'm sure. And how do you make money? It's very hard to monetize as a creator without permission, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just go make a movie. You can't just go make a television show. Commercials are hard. TikTok is specific. You can be a social creator, but the content is not the same as a narrative uh, story uh, like a short film. So it occurred to me that there's a new opportunity, right? We've been trying to solve, we, the, the world, the, the entertainment marketing world, have been trying to solve for this concept of branded content. We talk about it now. Every meeting, branded content, branded content. And the best example of branded content was the BMW films, which were done 20 years ago initially, by anonymous content and still we haven't found a better example of branded content even though everyone talks about it and i believe the solution is what we're calling unbranded content that in a couple of things are happening now mateo we've got many 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 more advertisers mm -hmm. many more advertising platforms on digital we have a decreasing set of metadata as privacy concerns have uh, led direct to consumer content to be harder to measure on Facebook and Instagram, et cetera. And so there's a movement into a new kind of connection between a brand and its audience, which is an emotional one, a relevance, a question of relevance, a question of 
connectivity and associative value, right? It's not just, here's my candle, buy my candle. It's now mm -hmm. two people having an intimate moment with a candle in the middle and the takeaway is an emotional connection to that content, right? So I see a movement there. And so all of these things were swirling in my head for a long time. How do I solve for this? And it all coalesced in the vision for X for Y. And X for Y.com, what it is, is a managed marketplace where behind a paywall. So when you as a creator put your content up, only subscriber companies can see it. We built this to link that creative community to a large contingency of contingent rather of, of buyers, which does has never existed. We're creating an opportunity, a new product as well as a new market. So the market links creators and brands. The product is unbranded content. So we are trying to say to all these people who are wasting hundreds of millions of dollars globally on short films and on creative that will not ever monetize, to take the same effort, the same money, less time probably, and make 30 second commercials that have brand ubiquity, that can speak to many, many, many brands because it mm -hmm. is emotional or funny or moving or shocking or whatever it is, and some company can slap their logo on that. They will own it. You, the creator, sets the price. So you're happy. Your team is happy. And it's off. The other thing that it will create, and it already has, is a community inside uh, hmm. of x for y for creators to collaborate with each other. And, and so now with x for y when you have an account, you will be able to interact with each other if you have a great idea, but you need a director, you can find one. If you're a filmmaker and you need a great cinematographer, you can find one. If you need an animator, you can find one. If you need music, we got it. We also will bring you influencers and talent who can create even more of a proposition so that when you have completed your work, you also have built-in distribution opportunities to make your price higher. You know, this is eBay for content. And, uh, but where we're focused is spec unbranded commercials. And, uh, and, and it's a lot of fun. I think brands are starting to, to see, some, not all, are starting to see that they'd rather have something really emotional or funny or memorable and then put their logo on it than have their product in the yes. actor's hands. And I think that evolution is gonna open up the door widely for what we're doing at x for life yeah, I think if people even car commercial, I think they're tired of seeing just the car driving through skylines and everything, you know, maybe a story with the grandpa and the kid together. I think that's the future for sure. And uh, what you're doing is interesting because uh, what's behind, I think it's interesting, is the network that you have of connection, right? This hinges on, on company, on buyers being in the marketplace for the creative. Now, I should say, I talk about brands, but I talk about brands in a, in a, in a very broad way. Mm -hmm. the, the real solution here is you spend $1,000 making something and maybe Gatorade buys it, but probably not because there's a lot of friction against that. But there are thousands of companies that can't afford or don't think they can afford a commercial, right? True. I've spoken to so many companies who wish they had a, the ability to make a commercial, but they can't afford to go to a creative agency to figure out production, take that risk. So this doesn't have to be everything selling for global brands. In fact, it's designed for the millions of companies that advertise mm. on our Twitter and our Facebook and our Instagram. And, uh, and so the perceptual advantage of a, of a, of a produced high-end video content is a massive unlock and a massive solution at scale for a global community of, of advertisers, Mil tens of millions of them. How are you planning to get companies on board? Like, how do they know that there is this place where they can actually purchase a, a commercial? Well, that's, the, that's our job, right? I mean, we are doing our own outreach. We're signing up brands left and right. They're finding out about us from you know, opportunities like this. We want to create an opportunity to monetize creativity and discovery, right? And so we're bringing the brands, but we are also bringing Hollywood. We are also bringing us 
to the equation. And if we see great things, we want to help our creators figure out how to break in to the long form narrative storytelling that most of most creators aspire to. But even if they don't, there is a really good business to be made yep. just by making unbranded content that is, to be really clear, not generic. It has to look like a story. It has to have emotional value. It's not just two people talking about nothing. And so we're finding that it doesn't have to be category specific, but it still has to tell something emotional enough that a, a company has association to that content, right? But that's yeah. the fun. And because technology is getting so crazy, you can actually shoot some, I mean, as I see, there's no more excuses. The problem is the story, which is, you know, something I wanted to talk about because now I have a, you know, a 12K camera. I have a, I, I can do anything. This, this computer here, I can edit 12K footage on the go. But how important is the story? Because you were saying it. And uh, if you're a storyteller, story is, yep. is everything right? So yep. you can't underestimate story. And I think that's part of the problem with advertising is that it has True. always been underestimated. It used to be that the most memorable commercials, you don't remember where the product was in the commercial. You remember the, the line, the comedy, the, you know, the most famous commercials. The one, if, if, if you think, if your audience thinks about the 10 commercials they remember, they will remember the commercial nine out of 10 times, if not 10 out of 10, but they won't remember what the product looked like, who was holding it, what the car was. They'll, right? Everybody remembers in this country, yeah. where's the beef, right? That was years and years ago. Um, they, they remember, what's up? The Budweiser, which was actually yep. a spec commercial uh, initially, but huh. they don't remember who was holding the beer, what the actor looked like, maybe, or, you know. They remember the emotional connection to that story, whatever it is. So my um, proposition to creators globally is this. Think about a 30 second story, shoot that story, have it be funny, have it be emotional, have it have no brands inside of it. Don't wear a Nike swoosh, don't make it for Gatorade, don't make yep. it for a brand, make it for a story. Two people, having the most beautiful moment over dinner hmm. can apply to 500 brands whose brand ethos is about connectivity, about kindness, about love, about ambition, whatever. So the, the winning, and, and you can see examples on x4y.com of commercials that are brand agnostic that have multiple um, brand connectivity. So I, I encourage your users, well, certainly to sign up, your subscribers should sign yep. up for X4Y yep. because we are also sending out opportunities that are coming from brand. Yeah, I saw a couple of emails. Yep. Pretty amazing what you said is true. It's because uh, sometimes we put those Nike sneakers in there because we are trying to do it for Nike, but that's a big mistake, especially if you want to sell it to another brand. Because of course, what I tell people is like, Nike will never buy it. I mean, it happened what, once in a million times. Nike That's... will never buy it, like you said. And also, if you were if you were have, making a lemonade stand as a kid, and you said, I only want to make this cup of lemonade for my neighbor, Joe. If Joe's yep. not home, you don't sell any lemonade. True. So you make a lemonade stand for anyone who's driving by. And so we're doing the same thing with commercials. Make a commercial for anyone who's driving by, right? Not every piece of content will work for every kind of company. But if you have a person, instead of having a, a, a soccer player doing something awesome across a soccer field in Nike shoes and then putting the Nike swoosh at the end of your spec commercial, just have that soccer player in nondescript shoes doing whatever he or she is doing and at the end of it, it could work for Nike. It could work for Tom Brady's company. It could work for a soccer team. It could work, you know, and all of a sudden you see that just like that Uber driver, my friend, who is not sitting in her car, just waiting for Joe to call her. She's waiting for anyone nearby yep. to call her uh, and, and order a ride. That's what we're doing. We are going to take your content. You're going to help us identify the categories and the specific brands you like. And then we, with algorithm and AI and other metrics, are going to deliver to our thousands of companies 
your content that we think they will buy. How to approach it if you're a creator, right? It sounds good, I imagine, but how do we do this? And what are the things you should be thinking about and executing, yeah. right? So, yeah. so first and foremost, like you said, Mateo, and you're right, starts with a story. Next, it starts with, then you got to have a team. You have to execute it, right? And you want people to yeah. buy in on doing this on spec because that's the biggest challenge, right? You got to spend yep. your money to do it. The next thing is to, once you've got your story and your crew and your team, no brands, no brands in it, no brands referenced, make sure nobody's wearing any identifiable brand. Mm -hmm. We will provide our creators with all of the paperwork and all of the tools they'll need to ensure yep. that they are clearing their material. But you still have to make sure that even even a building in the background might have to be cleared. Then you make it, don't put a logo on it, and then you upload your commercial. We make sure that, that it's not wildly inappropriate, and then we will bring it into our platform. It will be promoted to the brands that x for y believes would buy it. They will see it. The creator sets the price. We do not take from the creator. Uh, we charge a premium to the buyer. So if you, if you price your, your content at $10,000, that's the price. And boom, you've now sold your lemonade. This is all designed to empower creators to make money and, and create a, uh, an opportunity that has never existed. We want to create as many jobs as possible for people and, and monetize the creation of content in a way that's never been done. It's awesome. I love it. And when I talk about my behind the scenes stuff, I'm like, the problem with spec is always the same. It goes online. It's my portfolio. It's beautiful. We make it for the glory. But if we can actually make money out of it. There are thousands, tens of thousands of spec commercials. We've seen them. Uh, so it's not that it doesn't exist. It's just that it's, it's, it's very hard to do that on a repeated basis if you yep. can't get your money back or make profit on it. So mm. I would like to see more people take those risks and have them be rewarded. And, and of course the price can go, I mean, there is no limit to how much a commercial can sell for. We are also going to be blasting out opportunities to make spec commercials for a specific buyer, right? So oh. We will come to you, the creative community, and we will say this company is offering $100,000 to the best spec commercial, right? Wow. This is a great way to get into the spec commercial game. You're not guaranteed to get that $100,000 award because that's going to come from the, the brand is going to choose its winner. But the beauty of doing it this way is that once that winner has been selected, if it is not your commercial, you can still put your commercial on X for Y and we can sell it to a different company. No, no, it's cool. I mean, I'm pumped, man. I'm <laughs> I can't wait to do more spec. Yeah, there's an interesting question from um, Gotago Diego. It's a question about writing. What is the best way to attract producer when you have a narrative script that's ready to be made? And as an up-and-coming writer director, what's the best way to build a, a resume when, you're in, when your intention is to create original works? Love Spolla. Perfect film. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't mean to sound crass, but I, I think the best way is to write a great screenplay, right? Because if it's not great, it doesn't matter. And I'm a firm believer that just as a general rule, the cream will find its way to the top. Uh, but absent relationships, if you have a great screenplay, uh, I think you need to start writing emails to producers. And in many cases, they won't read it, but in some cases they will. We have a policy at my firm of not reading unsolicited screenplays. That's a legal protection. Huh. But if you give me a log line, I might respond to it, right? If the letter is compelling, we do read them from time to time. Uh, we just say to them, we are now soliciting your script. We just don't send it because if you, somebody sends me a screenplay, I can't read it. But if they send me a note saying, here's what it is, it's a story of these two people in Vietnam and it's da 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 da. And if it seems like something we might be interested in, we will. So I think we're in a world where everyone is accessible now. Yep. Uh, you, if you're not resourceful enough to find out how to reach people, you probably shouldn't be doing it in the first place. So be resourceful. There are many ways to find 
out how to contact the producers. And I would definitely think about people that have made the kinds of films or television shows that you've written. Um, I wouldn't go to a person who only does comedy movies with a, you know, a Korean War epic <laughs> uh, as a first stop. Not generally, I mean, a lot of producers, including me, want to do lots of things, but in terms of accessing uh, the right producers, that's a better way to start. The other thing I highly recommend, and I say this when I teach my classes, is read about the industry every day. Uh, one of the things I see even the greatest film school students in the world not do is read the Hollywood Reporter, Deadline.com, Variety.com, Puck, right? You have to see the business. You have to learn the players. You have to see the trends. You have to understand who's doing what. And, and you wouldn't go into finance and never read the Wall Street Journal. Why would you want to go into entertainment and never read our version of the Wall Street Journals? And so become educated because also it will teach you not only where the market is going, what kinds of films are working, not just on the box office on Monday morning, but months ahead because we're making True. these things a year in advance of the time that the public is seeing it. It will give you information about what to be writing, who to be contacting, how to think about it, making sure. And another thing that it does is it makes sure that you're not spending the next six months writing something that someone just sold to Paramount. True. Right? So you should know these things. This information is crucial on a daily basis. In terms of directing, um, I mean, first of all, the same thing applies. Uh, how do you get discovered? Well, make great stuff. How do you make great stuff? Well, short films are still viable and important. Um, I, I would argue, go to X for Y and make commercials because that will teach you how to become a better director. It will connect you. It will give you money if you succeed. And, uh, and, and also I would say, you got to have a great script or a great reason to direct something. So, you know, and, and I would say one thing, just this is a general thought for filmmakers. It's fairly unpopular, but it's, but it's, but I'm right. There is this vocabulary I've heard my whole career from young directors. I just got to make my first movie and then I can do something I really want. I got to go make it so that I can show that I can do it. That is a terrible mistake. Do not make a movie unless you can make it great because filmmakers don't get second chances unless the first one is good. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I will tell you a story. There is a, a writer, I'm not gonna say her name, a very successful screenwriter. I was involved with her on a, on a movie that she had written. And it was a brilliant script. And she decided midway that she wanted to direct it. She'd never directed a movie. <laughs> She was a very accomplished screenwriter. 15 years, 10 movies made, hits, real hits. She wanted to direct this movie. Everyone was like, great, she's earned the right to direct this movie. Actors were starting to sign on. Has she ever directed a movie? No, because she's a writer, right? Hmm. She made a mistake. She said one day, oh, you know, I did do a short film back in college. Ooh. <laughs> Well, so now these actors are like, well, look, I want to see that short film. It was 15 years prior. The short film was not good enough. Her writing was a 10. The short film was a six. It was 15 years before. Wow. The actors all dropped out because they didn't think she had the directing chops. Ooh. It is really, and, and she did have the directing chops, by the way. But you don't get to undo your work as a director. A writer, you can always write another script and you'll be judged on the merits of that screenplay. A director, wow. you've done it. It's like, it's like a criminal record. It better be clean wow. or it's there. And this is really, if I'm saying anything to a creative community that I think is most valuable, especially for directors, get it right. No one gives you credit for the, that I didn't have the money to get the actor I wanted. So I used my cousin, no, because they don't care. They saw yep. your cousin's work and it wasn't good. And you're responsible as the director for the quality, yep. right? And so that's my most heartfelt advice to filmmakers. Wait, get it right, not right away. It's more important. And, uh, and so find the right material, 
get the right actors, have the budget you need no matter what, right? It doesn't mean that you have to have a big budget, just make sure that you're not suffering, that, that the quality is not suffering yep. because of that budget. So, that's, yeah. that's pretty, pretty amazing uh, advice. The other question, what is the best way to network and make connection with people in the industry uh, without going the PA route? This is an interesting question because it's, they say it's all about connection, you know, and uh, I struggle personally too, you know, getting the, when I was in LA to get the right connection because everybody was so busy and what is the best way to actually make connection except going out in a bar or dinner or, or you know. I don't know that I have the answer to what's the best way, but I can throw out some ideas. Work in a talent agency, get in the mailroom. You meet all these agents, you learn the names, you learn, the, that's why they put, it, kid, they put people in the mailroom, not to punish them, but so that they learn the names of everybody in the agency. They see the names of everybody who's sending something in. It's, uh, you know, the best way to make a connection is to know who you want to connect with, right? I mean, you can meet a million people, you just want, but it's more important to meet the right 10. Yep. Uh, and I think that's a thing. I think most people say, I need connections. Like find a, the one person you need to connect with and figure out how to get to that person, right? That starts yep. with educating yourself as a creator uh, on who you need to connect with. Globally, there are, there are film communities in every country because film yep. is a part of our, of our culture. Find out, go work at the film commission, go figure out who's, who are the people or the companies that are, that are disrupting, that are doing good work intern, socialize, be an assistant. Being an assistant is a great way to meet people because you're exposed not only to yep. what your executive's uh, job is, but you're also talking to other assistants. And, and so I, I think the best way is, 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 well, there is no right way or a best way, but you have to put yourself, you have, you know, everyone says, oh, I didn't get lucky with this one. Well, luck is, is a function of where you are and seeing the opportunity, right? So it's very hard. You can't say I want to make a career in Hollywood and never interact with Hollywood. It doesn't mean you have to get on a plane and be in Hollywood, but you have True. to figure out a way to interact with it. About winning the Oscar with Spotlight, about a feeling, you know, because you always dream about it. Does it motivate you to get another one or it makes you feel like, okay, I made it and you feel more, not comfortable, but more maybe relaxed. What is the, how does it feel? I don't, I don't know that it's either of those two. I don't know that it's a motivator to try to replicate it or that, it's a, a, that it provides a sense of like, I've done everything I need to do. I think it actually, for many people, including me, creates a burden of, can I, can I do it again? Should huh. I try? Because it would, it's so unlikely. Uh, should I have even got it in the first place? I mean, for me, it was obviously a wonderful uh, personal opportunity yep. but but it was also meaningful for that film to amplify its message to a more global community and, and that was the most important thing uh that came from winning the oscar in my mind's eye but yeah i think everybody has a different point of view on, on how it affects them I, I would love to win another one because who wouldn't mm. uh but uh it's not what drives me is it what drives okay. me to just tell good stories and, and do good work that's awesome. And Third is Why was original Netflix show, yeah? Yes. Well, we brought it to Netflix and then they bought the show from us and we made it with Netflix. Can you, if you can, talk a little bit? Because, you know, it's always talk. Oh, yeah, maybe it's going to go on Netflix. Maybe we can do this for Netflix. Uh, how does that word work in terms of you have an idea, you have something. How does it get, how do you get to Netflix? Because I know they have agents that, but... Well, I get to Netflix because I have a long-standing relationship with Netflix from the very beginning, and and we have a my company has a deal with Netflix, so that's my home base. Okay. That's my family, they're great. Uh, the way somebody who doesn't have that opportunity would get to Netflix is, you know, to make to have a great script and find the right producer and get it in or the right agent. Um, I don't think Netflix would just uh, read a script from anybody who sent it in without that. Uh, without that conduit. You need to have a producer or an agent or a lawyer or someone who has a direct relationship with someone at Netflix to get that in. Because I, I, I'm not certain of this, but I imagine as a matter of policy, they do not accept unsolicited material. 
Yeah, man, I think we get, we went through pretty much all the question here. What's your what's your uh, best memory from uh, Spotlight? My what's my best memory from Spotlight? I mean, that experience was wonderful all along. I think for me, the best memory is when we got to shoot in Fenway Park in Boston. Uh, I'm a big baseball fan, and so to be able ah. to have uh, have that experience was great. And we actually shot during a game, so we oh, had wow. forty thousand fans there. It was an actual game. We had just blocked off two or three rows uh, for our actors and another two or three rows for our camera crew. And, and uh, it was awesome. But look, that whole experience was amazing. And most important was that it actually, I think, made some kind of an impact in the world. A lot more accountability for the church. It's still a long way to go. Um, but yep. uh, I'm very proud of the impact that it had. That's awesome. Cool, man. Uh, unless you have anything else you want to add, I think we... Oh, man, I'm so grateful. Listen, whatever you need, uh, if you need to do more, whatever, I can put this shirt yeah. on again. And if any of your, uh, you know, your subscribers have questions uh, as a follow-up to this, yep. have them comment uh, below and, and I will look at them as personally and respond to them as best I can um, or someone else from X for Y or okay. my company will. So please know we want this to be a, the beginning of a relationship with your subscribers. Yep. You do great work. Uh, we would love to interact with you and them on an ongoing basis. Appreciate uh, and, uh, it. Anything I can do to help you, I'm, I'm super into it. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for being here, and I'll send you the link once it's ready. Thank you very much, too. All right. Bye, man. Bye-bye.